Good evening, everyone. Um, I'm Dimitrios Kostopoulos, uh, uh, co-founder of uh, Hands-On Seminars, and uh, I would like to welcome you all um, participating in uh, today's uh, uh, webinar in uh, um, the area of uh, updates in research uh, in myofascial trigger point therapy. Um, before we start, um, I would like to get a sense of uh, uh, who is uh, 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 on the call with us. Um, and uh, I would like to ask you uh, where specifically are you watching from right now? Uh, so I have um, released a poll right now. Um, and please um, answer the question. So, um, and I know that every time there are people who vote from other, please do me a favor and specifically explain uh, maybe in the chat box what location of the world you are um, uh, watching from. So this way, um, next time um, we um, indicate um, your country or the region of the world where you are watching because we get people uh, so frequently from uh, other countries or other regions uh, of the world uh, watching and um, uh, we're not always 100% sure uh, if uh, um, they, uh, w what region they're watching from. And also, um, we would like to know if you have taken uh, previously any courses with uh, hands-on seminars so we can uh, uh, get an idea of uh, how many are uh, existing uh, students and how many uh, have not had any courses with uh, our organization. And uh, it seems that 50% um, uh, of you have taken courses previously with us and the other 50% uh, have never taken a, a course with us. Uh, so, um, as I said, I am uh, uh, Dimitrios Kostopoulos and uh, in, um, I'm co-founder of Hands-On Seminars and uh, in the call, in the webinar, we also have uh, uh, the other founder of Hands-On Seminars, uh, uh, Dr. Rizopoulos, who will be also presenting uh, in today's webinar. Uh, and I would like to take the chance to, before I start, to talk to you a little bit about what we call the Hands-On Seminars Toolkit. Um, our program that many of you know as uh, Mastery Certification in Manual Therapy implements uh, a concept uh, that we call the Hands-On Seminars Toolkit. Through the years, uh, we've, been, um, uh, we've been treating patients for uh, over 25 years. Through the years, uh, we realized that no one specific therapy can be panacea for treating all um, patient problems. Uh, and you, as a therapist, have to have uh, a variety uh, of repertoire or man of manual therapy approaches to treat effectively a patient. Uh, and uh, this is why, uh, through the years, we, are, we realized that utilizing only one specific manual therapy approach and prescribing to one specific philosophy is not necessarily the most effective way to actually treat patients, uh, simply because some patients will res for the same pathology will respond better to one treatment approach, some other patients will respond better to a different treatment approach, some other patients will respond better to a combination of approaches. As a matter of fact, this is not new to medicine. Um, you have um, uh, many, uh, you have uh, blood pressure, let's say, high blood pressure. And there are many, many different types of medications that work through different physiological mechanisms to affect the body to decrease blood pressure. Depending on if a patient responds better to a diuretic or to a beta blocker or to a calcium blocker or to a, 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 an ACE inhibitor or to an ARB, depending on what would be their best response, a physician will select the proper medication to prescribe. It's not different with physical therapy. Some patients will respond better to one approach, some other patients will respond better to a different approach. This is why our MCMP program, the Master Certification in Manual Therapy, utilizes the integration of a variety of manual therapy approaches 
so that when you finish the program and you walk away certified, you have an extensive uh, knowledge, you have a toolkit of um, a variety of approaches to treat your patients. But without any further delay, I want to go into the topic of today's presentation. Uh, and I am making the assumption that all of you have a good understanding uh, of the area of myofascial trigger point therapy and that um, you have had some exposure in myofascial trigger point therapy before you are taking this, um, this uh, webinar. So I am assuming that you are not totally novice in uh, uh, the concept of my fashion trigger point therapy. Uh, nevertheless, I will utilize um, uh, one of the most um, um, popular definitions of uh, my fascial trigger points so that I can clarify a misconception that exists in the field of my fascial trigger point therapy. So, my fascial trigger points were defined by Jeanette Travel as uh, a highly localized, hyper irritable, hypersensitive, hyper irritable spots in a palpable tote band of skeletal muscle fibers. So, this is the definition that Dr. Travel uh, gave. But if you bear with me for a moment as I'm trying to enlarge the screen so I can show you something, I would like you to see this. If, for example, I'm going to draw something and I hope uh, you can all see. Uh, if, for example, this is a muscle and I have here several muscle fibers, then when uh, I'm talking about the presence of a myofascial trigger point in some of these fibers, I do not necessarily define the trigger point as a little spot. I rather define the trigger point as an area of hypersensitivity, an area of hyperirritability that can extend a, in, within a substantial vicinity of uh, the muscle. So it is a misconception for people to think that the myofascial trigger point is just a little spot. It is rather an area of hypersensitivity and hyper irritability. Of course, as you are going closer to the center of that area, uh, that will produce a more um, uh, a more symptomatic response. Uh, another thing that I would like to discuss with you is the notion of muscle shortening. Um, those of you who, have, who are working in uh, the area of my fashion to your point therapy, you know very well that muscles that contain myofascial trigger points are shorter muscles. If, for example, this is the normal length of a muscle, uh, a myofascially involved muscle will be shortened. Um, this is actually one of the pictures we utilized in um, our um, publication, um, um, the Manual of Trigger Point and Myofascial Therapy. Now, there are some implications about this shortening. First of all, why do we have muscles that are shortened? The muscles are shortened because there is an overlap in the sarcomeres. There is an overlap between the actin and myosin filaments. And this overlap that is also evident here, if we consider this purple being the myosin and the red on the top being and the bottom being the actin, there is an overlap between acting and myosin filaments, which creates this um, uh, shortening of the muscle. So now, the question is, a myofascially involved muscle, is it a strong muscle? Is it a weak muscle? Or it does not really matter 
um, in the muscle strength in terms of the uh, shortening of the sarcomere. Well, just imagine that in order for a muscle to exhibit its maximum possible tension, let's put in parentheses strength, we're going to equate muscle tension with strength in principle in this case, for a muscle to exhibit 100% of the, uh, <laughs> okay, thank you very much, uh, who is that? Thank you very much, Mohini. Uh, you are answering the question that it is a weak muscle. Thank you. Indeed, it's a weak muscle. So le let's elaborate to why it is a weak muscle. Uh, if we look at the length tension relationship curve here, we can see clearly that for a muscle to exhibit 100% of the maximum possible tension, of the maximum possible strength, the sarcomeres must be able to form the maximum number of cross bridges between acting and myosin filaments. And if this is not possible, if this is an overlap of the sarcomeres, then I'm going to have less of, um, a, uh, less of a strength, less of a tension of the muscle. I'm going to make this a little bigger so I can show you an example. So look at my fingers here. If this is acting and this is myosin filaments, and they, by overlapping each other, they form cross bridges. Let's say that I have the formation of 100 of cross bridges in this case. When the muscle is stretched at an optimal length, I can form, let's say, 100 of cross bridges. Forming 100 of cross bridges will produce, let's suppose, 100 newtons of force. Okay, I'm giving hypothetical numbers. But what if now, what if the, the muscle is myofascially involved? What if there is some shortening between acting and myosin filaments which will require this overlap? So some of the cross bridges are already occupied. And therefore, when interaction begins between acting and myosin filaments, the potential for cross bridges is cut in half. So I only have 50% now of cross bridges being able to be formed and for this reason the muscle will be able to exhibit only 50% in that case of its uh, capacity for strength, for tension. Therefore, a myofascially involved muscle is a weak muscle. And I am going to propose something to you tonight. That a myofascially involved muscle can become strengthened, can become stronger without stretching exercises, I'm sorry, without strengthening exercises, but only with the application of stretching exercises, at least in the beginning. Because if you have a muscle that is really myofascially involved and shortened, that muscle will exhibit as weak muscle. When you get that post-surgical patient, the post-surgical patient with the knee surgery, with the shoulder surgery, and all the muscles are tightened up, it is not necessarily the best action to start doing weight strengthening on that patient before you do appropriate and enough release of the myofascial element and stretching of the myofascial element. The pure Mere stretching of the myofascial element will be able to increase the muscle strength of the muscle by half to one degree in that same session. In that same session. So you may have to have some amazing results in terms of gaining strength on the muscle just by stretching the muscle without doing strengthening. And the evidence, as I said, is in the length tension relationship here. Now, I would like to... Um, just refresh, remind to those of you who have taken um, the hands-on seminars courses in the past that when we teach you the concept, the principle of my fascia trigger point therapy, we teach you this technique called progressive pressure, pressure release technique, PPRT. What 
is PPOT? When we apply ischemic compression on a myofascially treated muscle, this ischemic compression has to be applied gently up to the point where you feel a barrier, up to the point where you feel a resistance from the muscle, and you maintain that for about 45 minutes or more. Then, as the resistance decreases under your fingertips, you continue applying greater and greater pressure until you reach the next barrier and then the next barrier and so on and so forth. So you apply a gradually increasing force. And you always follow that up by myofascial stretching. And in the question, how long that myofascial stretching has to be exhibited for, we say that the myofascial stretching must be applied for at least 45 seconds per position. And the reason for that is a study that was published a few years ago that demonstrates that when we stretch passively a muscle for at least 30 seconds or more, that passive stretch is capable of creating myofibrillogenesis. In other words, we are able to create, to produce new myofibrils inside the muscle. And this is what you want. You want to cause myofibrillogenesis, to cause new myofibrils inside the muscle so that you can permanently increase the, the length of the muscle. This is a very important concept. But now, what happens really when we apply this pressure? For years now, we tell you in the seminars that, uh, in essence, this ischemic compression that we apply is when we release the pressure, that pressure is being followed by reflexive vasodilation that brings significant amounts of blood into the area. And I want to remind you something. I want to remind you that a myofascially involved muscle has decreased blood supply and therefore decreased oxygen. And if I have less oxygen, I have less ATP. And with less ATP, not only I have a further tightening of the muscle, because in order for these cross bridges, for the actin and myosin filaments to disengage from each other, they require ATP. Without ATP, I have a state similar to that of rigor mortis. The only difference is that the person is alive. But this is what happens really when somebody dies. When somebody dies, you have depletion of ATP, and therefore the person becomes stiff. The muscles become stiff. That's why the dead people are stiff, because of lack of ATP. That causes this permanent, um, permanent uh, latching of the actin and myosin filaments. So we need ATP, and in order for us to have enough ATP in the area, we need more blood to bring more oxygen in order for the body to process via aerobic rather than anaerobic metabolism. Remember that aerobic metabolism will produce 34 up to even 36 uh, ATPs if we take into account the um, hexos monophosphate uh, uh, path. So, but on the other hand, anaerobic metabolism, the cycle of lactic acid, will produce maybe one or two ATPs. So you don't have enough ATP. Uh, a study took place uh, recently. It was uh, actually published uh, in uh, this last month, in September of 2012, in the archives of physical medicine and rehabilitation. And what they looked at this study, they looked at... Uh, um, uh, this was actually a pilot study a proof of principle pilot study. So they are looking uh, what would be the changes in the blood flow and the cellular metabolism at the myofascial trigger point uh, when somebody does a trigger point release with ischemic compression. And obviously, in a study like this, this is a, 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 a proof of pilot, a proof of principle pilot. So they only did it in two subjects. And uh, what they did in these uh, um, uh, two subjects, they, did, uh, they inserted a microdialysis catheter inside a myofascial trigger point and they looked for interstitial fluid. So 
the bottom line of the article is that uh, uh, there are different metabolites that uh, someone can look and biomarkers that someone can look um, when they apply ischemic compression and in the presence of my fascia trigger points, but most likely it is lactate that would be more relevant in the detection and treatment of abnormalities of a myofascial trigger point. Uh, remember, a, a, a myofascial trigger point, it's going to have plenty of lactate in that area, and that becomes of some value. Now I want to remind you something else, that one of the techniques we teach you in the seminars uh, for myofascial trigger points is that in addition to the trigger point uh, ischemic compression technique, we teach you the spray and stretch technique. And for those of you who are not familiar, I want to remind you that uh, a few years back, um, Constantine and myself, we published a, a study in the Journal of Mus Musculoskeletal Pain where we looked at the effects of uh, spray and stretch uh, in passive and active hip flexion. So this is what we found, and, and, and I will explain to you a little bit uh, about that. And I know there is a question. Let me see the question um, for a second. All right, I'll get it. Uh, whoever asked the question, I'll answer in a second because uh, I, I need to continue this. I don't want to interrupt the flow. So um, there is, um, uh, in uh, the case we did uh, in the passive and active hip flexion, we found that the application of spray and stretch created allowed for a greater a statistically significant different uh, hip flexion gain uh, over the group that received only stretching and this was true for both the active uh, and the passive uh, range of motion uh, we had another observation that females achieved a greater uh, pre post test difference uh, on the active range of motion, but that was not so significant for the study as a finding. But let me explain to you a little bit what we have here, what exactly happens. So, what actually is happening here is that um, when we have uh, in a muscle a myofascial trigger point like this one, this myofascial trigger point makes the muscle being shortened. So when we apply stretching on the muscle, there is a pain stimulus that is being transmitted to the spinal cord and up with ascending pathways to the sensory cortex. And of course, this pain, not only it can have, it, it can increase the autonomic effects on the muscle and on the trigger point, but also it will increase the muscle contraction. When you hurt, when you feel muscle pain, you are guarding. This is what this slide tries to show you. But at the same time, that slide tries to show you that when you actively use the cold spray, the spray and stretch, the cold stimulus, and it's not only the cold stimulus because we cannot produce exactly the same effect with an ice, cube, an ice cube, for example, it is the sudden cold stimulus sends a bombardment of cold stimuli to the spinal cord, closing that gate of pain, interrupting the pain stimulus. Now, we must make a very significant distinction here, my friends. And the distinction is, we do not use the sprain to release the trigger point. We use the sprain only when there is pain and inhibition from the muscle that decreases the amount of stretch that we try to produce after we apply our ischemic compression on the trigger point. So this is a very important distinction that you need to understand. Another topic is the topic of, of headaches. You know that uh, we give a lot of emphasis in headaches and we give a lot of emphasis actually in the treatment of headaches with the use 
of uh, amifacial trigger point therapy of the sternocleidomastoid muscle and other muscles such as the uh, upper trapezius muscle, the scalenus muscles, the temporal muscles and so on and so forth. But an interesting study that I found um, identified that um, obviously, especially women, uh, female patients have a greater incident, incidence of uh, uh, chronic tension headaches. So what they found is that if you just do a myofascial trigger, mas trigger point massage in the neck muscles, the head muscles, and the shoulder muscles in chronic tension headaches, and if you apply that for 10 weeks, this will produce a significant decrease in, um, the, in the tension headaches. It will produce a significant decrease in tension headaches. But I want to bring up now another um, thing, another study that I'm very excited about. Uh, probably um, you have seen the reciprocal inhibition uh, principle that, that, that we teach you in, in, in our courses, especially when we talk about the muscle energy technique. So uh, you remember that the principle of, of, uh, of uh, uh, reciprocal inhibition that if I have an uh, agonist muscle, uh, that this agonist muscle tries to execute a movement, the antagonist muscle will relax so that the agonist can produce um, the contraction that is needed. So, I mean, let me show you an, an example. Uh, and actually, I'm going to show you the example that is being utilized in the study. So, let's take, for example, my posterior deltoid and anterior deltoid. When I want to flex my shoulder and therefore to contract my anterior deltoid muscle for flexing this um, uh, shoulder, the posterior deltoid via the mechanism of reciprocal inhibition will relax to allow me to do the flexion of the shoulder. If my posterior deltoid was contracting the same time that the anterior deltoid contracts, my hand will go down. I wouldn't be able to execute the movement. All right, so this is the principle. Now let's see how this principle uh, was used in a recent uh, study. So what they did in this uh, study is the following. They found two groups of people, a group of people with latent myofascial trigger points in the posterior deltoid muscle, and another group of people with no myofascial trigger points, with absent myofascial trigger points in the posterior deltoid. And then they utilized the um, anterior deltoid to flex the uh, shoulder. So what they found was that there was increased motor unit excitability with reduced antagonist reciprocal inhibition. So what actually happened in this study was that the patients who had presence of myofascial trigger points, they had reduced efficiency of the reciprocal inhibition. The reciprocal inhibition mechanism did not properly work to relax the muscle, the antagonist muscle, um, during, uh, right after the contraction of the agonist. So, while you expect, in other words, um, the reciprocal inhibition mechanism to help the antagonist muscle relax so you can be able to execute your movements, if this doesn't happen, do you imagine the biomechanical implications? If I am trying to flex my head, to move my head into flexion, and I am expecting 
to for my neck extensors to relax reciprocally in order to allow me to do the neck flexion. Do you understand the implications if the neck extensors do not relax? If the neck, ext if the neck extensors do not relax, then the movement is not going to happen properly. I'm going to get perhaps greater compression forces in the spinal segments that can even lead to a disc herniation. And you have heard, probably if you have, if you have taken our courses, you have heard our hypothesis for the creation of a, a disc herniation from muscle tightness and, and, and how biomechanically that can lead to a disc herniation. Uh, and, and I hope that one of these uh, uh, days, this hypothesis and this model uh, will be proven. But uh, what I'm going to do, my friends, right now uh, is I am going to turn um, the uh, microphone and uh, the uh, presentation uh, to uh, my associate um, uh, and co-founder of Hands-On Seminars, uh, Dr. Rizopoulos, who is going to talk to you about something very interesting. He's going to talk to you about something called the Cinderella Principle. So we'll end the night talking about the Cinderella Phenomenon. All right, so uh, Costas, um, the, you are on. We cannot hear you though. Hold on, let me, let me see if I can uh, work this out. Now, what about now? Now you can now hear me, right? Yeah, you perfectly. Hello? Perfect. Excellent. Let me do something here, so I'm ready to go. Uh, okay. Now, uh, recently uh, I was exposed to an idea about the Cinderella hypothesis, and this is a very interesting concept. Hold it closer if you can. Well you mic. have to hold okay. it closer, yeah. Uh, Sorry. No problem, I'll do that. So, uh, the idea of Cinderella hypothesis uh, is totally related to, uh, as you see in the screen, um, that Cinderella, the first to rise and the last to go to bed. So, this is something very interesting that has to deal with uh, all these cases that they develop trigger points, myofascial trigger points, and usually uh, it's the, the problem starts long time before they come to see you as physical therapist. So, uh, the idea behind the sterile hypothesis by HAG uh, is that uh, low threshold motor units are always recruited first, before any other large one motor unit. And they're the last also to be deactivated. In other words, uh, if you can imagine right now um, someone typing or using the mouse, uh, you can think that the trapezius is working or some muscles are working, but those muscles are not overloaded. They're low load. There is a low load activity. So when there is a small activity, usually those low threshold motor units they will be activated. Those are the type 1 fibers motor units. So, studies that they've been done uh, on trapezius muscles, they have shown that those motor units are recruited in a fixed order. Small, low threshold motor units are recruited at low levels of contraction before the large ones. And the interesting part is that large ones are not going to be activated because the effort is so minimal. And that's, that's an amazing concept. And those are the cases that you don't see, unfortunately. Uh, those are the cases that uh, they have the latent trigger points. And I don't know if you know, but the latent trigger points are trigger points that they don't refer pain. You can cause pain if you palpate those trigger points, but they don't really refer pain. So it is an interesting situation that goes from the latent to an active one and back and forth. Um, and I'm certain that many of you have experienced that, uh, the occasional headache, uh, the occasional um, 
uh, stress related uh, therapies use pain all these aches and what we do usually uh, the educated ones they take their uh, they go to the gym they work out they do something to release the tightness they might stretch uh, the public though usually what it does it goes to uh, over the counter medication to get rid of those symptoms so I'm wondering how important it is uh, for us as physical therapists to really educate our clients, our patients, our, even our doctors, by the way, because unfortunately most of the MDs, they don't really know uh, how the muscular system works and instead of, you know, really referring to us these cases, they give them any medication. But that's a different story, another uh, <laughs> sad story actually. But um, imagine if you have the power to go inside uh, uh, an office uh, and find uh, the, the employer uh, and, 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 and really uh, go to a level of uh, teaching the employees how to um, avoid this problem, how to avoid activating and keeping those low threshold motor units active all the time. So in a work environment, as I explained to you, um, uh, imagine that psychological factors, right? and the physical environment is interconnected. Uh, we all know that uh, usually when it comes to um, thinking and stress and everybody I'm certain realizes the implications of um, uh, negative thinking, if uh, we can classify it as such, or anything stress related uh, scenario uh, along with your immediate environment because usually the environment <laughs> uh, promotes stress and uh, sometimes when we change the environment stress goes away. That's an interesting phenomenon that uh, usually uh, I suggest to my clients as the number one uh, cure to for their problems which is if you can change your environment that will be the best you can do for yourself. Uh, so again psychological factors and physical environment are it is totally interconnected and um, Muscular, musculoskeletal disorder uh, symptoms in a psychological stressful jobs and we can realize what a psychological stressful job can be and usually are the places or the jobs that we don't like. Uh, when you are in, uh, in an environment that you don't like what you do, uh, usually you go to uh, a stress level that uh, it will cause the creation of the Cinderella motor units. So, interesting enough, uh, even after work, uh, when uh, we leave work, uh, let's say you go for lunch, you know, you just stop work, we carry with us attention, we, we have it inside us, and it's a 24-7 thing, and, then, and that's something that gets built and the trigger points are created, and uh, from latent, as I said, they become active trigger points. Um, so when there is um, uh, low uh, threshold motor units are, are activated, are, are constantly working, what happens is we have increased calcium right, uh, deposits and there is a damaged uh, membrane uh, and of course that leads to muscle pain. Um, so just to close this, uh, uh, this presentation and, and, and just if you're interested you can always go and take a look at that study by uh, Trester uh, and all. Uh, and, all. Um, and what they did, they, 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 they found that even 30 minutes of typing uh, under visual or postural stress, stress, stressors uh, during computer work, they, they have seen activation of those uh, uh, low threshold motor units uh, leading to uh, trigger points and it's a very interesting study so uh, you can just go there and take a look and, and uh, what they try to explain is that today's, in today's environment and uh, with all the uh, work that or the kind of work that is out there and you know most of the people they don't work in uh, the fields, they don't work in factories, usually in the United States they do work in front of the computer, that's the future. And with that future, there is uh, a problem which is totally related to, um, to the Cinderella uh, hypothesis. And that will be all from my part. So if there is any question that you have to ask, please feel free to ask it right now.
Yeah, there was uh, actually, thank you Costas, uh, uh, great, uh, uh, great presentation there. Uh, and there was before uh, one uh, specific question, uh, and the question was uh, uh, asked by uh, Jose, Jose Gina, uh, and he asked, is myofascial, uh, should, is my facial stretch focused, should my facial stretch be focused on localized initially, then followed by a gross my facial stretch, uh, or only focused on local, localized my facial stretch? Listen, the answer to that is that all three different kinds of stretching in that capacity, as you are describing, because what you are describing is that gross stretching of the muscle or micro stretching that we can do in specific uh, uh, component of the muscle, in specific number of fibers of the muscle. Both of these can be very, very valuable and very helpful. It depends on the kind of patient you have. It depends on uh, the kind of, of problem you have. Sometimes doing gross stretching can be very effective. Some other times you need to do only micro stretching or sometimes you need to combine both. What I, what I will tell you though is that especially in chronic myofascial trigger points, we find that this micro stretching can be very effective. Muscles that they have acute or subacute trigger points, they tend to respond very nicely even to gross passive stretching. But very chronic problems, muscles with chronic myofascial trigger points, they do not respond as well in gross muscle stretching. That's why micro-stretching has a place there and even combination of other techniques such as uh, muscle energy technique and strain counter strain can be very, very effective in, uh, in that regard. Um, and uh, if there is no other question, let me see. Um, yes, I do not see any other questions right now. Um, therefore, um, I, will, uh, uh, I would like to ask you one final question from my side, uh, which is uh, the following. Um, how frequently would you like um, to participate in these type of webinars with our organization? Um, once a month, uh, twice a month, uh, once every two months? What would be an acceptable uh, frequency of webinars? We have very, very positive responses for webinars and we want to see how frequently you would prefer to have uh, webinars uh, with us. So it, it seems that um, uh, you guys are uh, uh, split uh, between the uh, once a month and uh, twice a month and actually uh, we are planning uh, to satisfy this uh, uh, need since our seminars will be once to twice a month, sometimes once, sometimes twice. So uh, I would like to thank you all on behalf of Hands On Seminars, uh, uh, Constantine and myself, for attending uh, tonight's uh, uh, webinar. I hope that you learned something new, that you learned something uh, different. And um, uh, remember to always uh, spread out there uh, the message of good quality manual physical therapy. Thank you so much. Have a good night.